great service this morning outside, and of course, we're continuing inside here for our auditorium service as well, and look forward to uh, continuing uh, our discussion this morning on what is a disciple. It's a good question if you was to survey everyone here and have you fill out a form of what a disciple is, we'd probably get many different answers. And I'm not saying that they would all, any of them would necessarily be wrong as long as they don't line up with the Bible. But I think if we're going to look at being a disciple, what it means to be a disciple, we ought to have at least as a church a common definition. What is it that the Bible says a disciple is? Disciple is a person, and that would be, of course, a noun. That's somebody that exists. It's not a verb, but yet we use the word discipleship almost like a verb where we do certain things, action, to become a disciple or make disciples, and we'll go through that as well. But the Gospel according to Matthew has what we call the Great Commission. And you have the Great Command, Lord, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy might. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second, like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now that's what we call the great command. Up on the screen we have the great commission. And the great commission says, as the Jesus, the last thing that Christ said before his uh, ascension into heaven, the last great uh, d command he gave them was, Go ye therefore and teach, disciple, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Another translation says it this way, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Teach, make, you can interchange those two words as a proper translation from the Greek. But it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So this morning I want to preach a message I simply titled, What is a Disciple? So let's pray together. Can we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for this church that is gathered here corporately. I thank you for those watching as well. And Lord, help us as we glean from your Word this morning. The definition of a disciple. Lord, speak to us. For those that are so far from God, bring them to you in conviction of whatever sin needs to be confessed. For those that do not know you as Savior, I pray this morning they will come to know salvation by grace, by faith and faith alone, through Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of sins. And for others here that are hurting, Lord, I pray that we could rest in your presence and your comfort and the surety that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, guide and direct as only you can. Fill me with the Spirit. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Defining the term. And that's interesting, and I think about defining. Certain definitions are very important. When I was at Auburn University, I graduated with an engineering degree. And uh, yes, I watched the game last night. Some of you could care less anyway, but we did lose even though we played incredibly bad, but we still lost anyway. But I went to Auburn University, and one of the things that all 50 states recognize is the de definition of an engineer. If you use the title engineer and you, you profess to be that, there's certain qualifications you have to come up with, or you can be sued, there's liability, and even criminal criminality for impersonating an engineer. Engineer is a term that has been defined by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that requires a license. Now they can go air conditioning engineer, you can do all of that, but generally that is a term that is well defined in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the Department of State and you go look it up, it defines what an engineer is. And that's very important because if that definition changes you can have buildings collapse, roads uh, uh, fall, in, uh, fall into the into the uh, rivers and streams, all kind of things can go bad. People can be killed because the definition of an engineer, somebody that designs that stuff, has to meet that definition. Same with doctors or lawyers. They have those type of definitions. Well, thinking of that, I thought about, well, let's look at the definition of disciple, which is really much more important from the eternal perspective of what is a disciple. 
What is it? Now, I've heard terms like, and not all of these are wrong. None of them are necessarily wrong. What's somebody who knows the Bible? Somebody who's saved and is learning. And yes, that's all correct. But let's look at this this morning. If we are going to truly be transforming not just our lives, our family, and our homes, we need to get a hold of the principle of what is a disciple. Jesus said a lot of things about that. By the way, Jesus speaks, we should listen. He says here in Matthew chapter, um, in Matthew chapter 28, he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So if we're going to make disciples, we need to know what it means to be one. Seriously, all of us, all of us together. You know, Jesus said a lot of things. What Jesus, when Jesus speaks, we should listen. Jesus is the one who has all authority in heaven and earth, according to Matthew 28. Jesus is the one whom it will be said, forever worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, might and honor and glory and blessing, according to Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 12. He is the one that Paul writes about in the, in the book of Philippians, and uh, chapter Philippians 5, uh, excuse me, 2, 10, where he says, Every knee shall bow, and every sh tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to take this seriously. Jesus had said quite a few things about disciples. Jesus commissions us because of his authority to make disciples of all nations. That raises a very fundamental question. One that every should take priority over all the how-tos of discipleship. What does it actually mean to be a disciple? The standard definition of a disciple, it's a noun, is someone who adheres to the teachings of another. As a follower, learner, it refers to someone who takes up the ways of somebody else. Applied to Jesus, a disciple is someone who learns from him, to live like him. Someone who, because of God's awakening grace through salvation, confirms his or her words and ways to the words and ways of Jesus. We need to understand that. I think of that. So really the big idea is we're going to break apart Matthew 4.19 and proof texts with other scriptures. I believe we can find the definition, the practical definition of disciple in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 19. He saith unto them, follow me. Follow. And I will make, I will change. And what do you do? Make fishers of men. Three errors. So the big idea here is a disciple follows Christ. Many ways you can say that's your head, you understand, you're saved, you've accepted Christ, you're transformed by Christ, that's your heart, and you serve making disciples of men, that's your hands, if you want to alliterate. Well, let's break down this and let's look at, number one, a follows and worships Jesus. A disciple follows and worships Jesus Christ. A follower. He said unto me, follow me. Follow me. Follow me means someone else leads. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus as Lord. Luke chapter 9, verse number 23 says this, And he said unto them, If any man will come after me, following him, let him deny himself, and take his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever shall lose his life, excuse me, save his life, shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Following. Following the Lord. I think of that. To follow in him means to acknowledge him as Savior and obey him. John 12, 26 says this, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also be my servants. Do you see that? If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. It means to serve as well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Jesus is saying, I will lead and you will go where I want you to go. You will do what I want you to do. He is to be your Lord and your Savior. When we begin to be disciples, we understand we will follow Jesus. We all have an identifying, we identify with groups, right? All of us do. 
I think of the game last night. Penn State was playing Auburn. They had what's called a whiteout. There was 110,000 fans there. Approximately 100,000 of them were of Penn State and about 10,000 were of Auburn. And it, you did not have a problem identifying which fans were the Penn State fans and which fans were the Auburn fans because they were identifying themselves with the team. And they wore either white shirts if it was the 100,000 that got it wrong, or they were in orange shirts if they were the 10,000 that got it right. And I'm being a little sarcastic there. But you had no problem because they have determined they were going to identify themselves with one team or the other. And because of that identification, it was the characteristic of their behavior, who they were cheering for, etc., etc. In many ways, ladies and gentlemen, a practical application is we have to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ as Lord. Are you following him? A disciple knows Christ and it makes a decision to follow him. Not, I got my fire insurance, I said a prayer, and then I believe I'm saved. Now, I believe you can be saved by, quote, crying unto God and saying a prayer. And I believe we're not all perfect. We're all a work in progress. We call that progressive sanctification. But we believe that clearly a disciple, one who's accepted Christ, is following him and open to him and listening to him and doing what Christ wants him or her to do. Jesus leads, following Jesus, excuse me, leads to changes in our motives. It begins with realizing who He is. Following Jesus changes the way we think. It changes our worldview. Brother Brandick has one of our grow classes. It's called having a biblical worldview. As a Christian, the way that we look at the world should line up with the Bible. There's a change. No doubt about that. It changes everything. God Proved it by resurrection from the dead as well. We find in Luke chapter 23, he says this. He said unto them, Christ says, If any man will come after me, follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One simple way to look at it is this. What does a cross represent? Death. Death. I die to self. He's saying, take up your cross, die to self daily, and follow me. But whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Following it means, look here, leaving things behind. In 1983, March of 1983, I married Ann Kenny of Jacksonville, Florida. Now it's Ann Ayers, your pastor's wife. And because of that marriage, there were things in my life that had to change. I was going to live with somebody that I've never lived with before in the bond of marriage. I understand that my friends would have to change. My messy ways would have to change. If you've ever met my wife, she is absolutely the spotless, cleanest person I've ever met as far as her house is concerned. I knew that would have to change. I knew that I would stop living for myself. There would be a big change. Someone else would be living with me. Someone else would be viewing me, viewing who I am through the lens of marriage. It was a game changer. Because of that act of marriage, changes had to take place. See, most fundamentally to follow Jesus is to worship Him exclusively. He is the one we worship. And there's a change. This is the heart of Jesus' message when He told the woman at the well that the, Father seeking, that the Father is seeking true worshipers, those that worship Him in spirit and in truth. Nothing will irritate our pluralistic society more than being an exclusive worshiper of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to draw a line in the sand and say, this is what God wants us to do. I think of that a lot. This whole worship, connect and grow is all around the area 
of worshiping Christ exclusively. We worship Him this morning at 9, 30, and 11 with song, with, with the scriptures, and with conviction, and with power. We connect with Him in a group where we do life together in groups where we pray about the messages and we, we understand and pray for each other. Just like the New Testament. Not just the message of Jesus, but the methods of Jesus, which He used primarily with Peter, James, and John, but with the Twelve. They did life together for three years. And then we study together as we grow through Bible doctrine and understanding what the Bible says. See, Matthew 4.19 means there's a change. Number two, a disciple of Christ is somebody who's been transformed. Changed. You ever seen somebody who's changed? I'm older. I'm 61 years old. I know that befuddles some of you. You can't understand how I could be somewhat. You think I'm probably older than 61. But the point is, I'm old enough to know. I look occasionally. I'll see people that were in my younger years, and now they've grown up. And they said, "Man, that guy got old. That girl got old, right?" But they're 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 aging because they've changed. I saw a picture the other day of this um, actor. I can't remember what his name was. He played Doogie Howser as the the doctor that was like 18 or something. Or 17. How many of you remember that show? I don't, okay, I'm just, how many of you don't really care? <laughs> so, uh, and I saw him and I says, well, that guy's as old as I am now. You know, I looked at him, but people change, things change. And what we understand is that's a natural process of life. But when you get saved, God should change you as well. You should not be the same. Paul talked about it in all of his pastoral epistle writings as we, we look at First and Second Timothy and Philemon. About change comes to the church and to the house of God because of who Jesus Christ is. So we find in the first part we said, follow me. The second part says, I will make you. I will make you change. A dramatic change. Change by the Spirit of God. Romans 12, 1 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what, prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Change. How does change possible? It's when you get exposure to who Christ is. Through the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling you at salvation. And through your daily walk with Him. A disciple's been changed by Christ. Think about Peter in Acts 4.13. Peter and John. We had had the great Pentecostal movement the big, at Pentecost. Where the, the movement of the, of the Holy Spirit at Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. With His salvation of souls were evident. And after that, there was a change in Peter and John. Peter, who denied the Lord three times, was now bold as a lion. He was willing to charge forward into Jerusalem and make a statement of who Christ was. And it says in Acts 4.19, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, how could these men be so different? They marveled. Now, don't miss this. Look at the screen, please, or if you have your Bible. They took knowledge that they had, what's left of the word had? Can we say it together? Been. Have you been with Jesus? Do you spend time with the Lord? And our grow group, we're really emphasizing journaling. We're asking all the people in our group as we go through the Bible each week, we're going to make references. We have a Bible reading plan we're going to discuss each week as we start the next week's lesson, and we're doing journaling. We're asking everybody to have a journal, to journal every day. Here's what God's doing. I use the word SOAP, S-O-A-P, Scripture, Observation, um, Analysis, and Prayer. Application, excuse me, and Prayer. And I want to be with Jesus. I want to have the type of relationship is that I know Him as my Savior. I've known Him since 1988. But I want to grow in grace. And by that, I want to have been with Christ. 
Let me ask you this. The only time you open the Bible is when you show up on a Sunday. How much time do you spend with Jesus? See, a disciple is someone that changes, is transformed. The best way to say that is through spending time with him. As we spend time with Jesus, he makes us more like him in our persons, in our hearts, in our characters. Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the saying, bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Changed by Scripture. Changed by spending time. Changed by prayer. Spending time. Transformed. I think of a person that attended here a while back. They moved to Arizona. And we had a lot of people that moved to Arizona. In fact, we could probably start a church in Arizona out of just the people that from here moved to Arizona. Between Arizona and Florida, right? But this, his name was Jim Hurd. Many of you know him. He's been here for a while. Jim Hurd was in his 80s, I guess, before they left. He's now gone to be with the Lord. And one of the things you say about Jim Hurd, by the way, he got saved when he was almost 60 years old, 55, 60 years old. That man was a servant. That man was helping out at the city mission and doing meals. He was always helping out here. He was doing all kinds of biblical, uh, helping people understand who God is and understand the Bible. And I want to tell you, he was something else. And he'll say, God changed me. See, the Bible says in Psalm, David writes in Psalm 139, Search me, O God. By the way, I want you to look at this. If you ever pray this, be ready. And know my heart. Try me. Have you ever done this? And know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And clean me up. And lead me in the way everlasting. You ever prayed that? By the way, God will reveal some things you need to deal with. Some things I need to deal with. At one time, the Lord was impressing on me that there was just something wrong. And it was a person I had offended. Indirectly, but you know, things happen. And through my prayer, and I'm not saying there was an audible voice or anything like that, God laid on my heart to go talk to this person. And what a sweet spirit it was as we talked together. God changes people. And a disciple is one who has been follows the Lord, but is transformed by the Lord. His heart is changing. He's searching. He's seeking. The prophet Ezekiel was prophesying the coming of the Holy Spirit and the change that would take place after Pentecost in our lives. And it says here, Ezekiel writes, he says, And I will give to them one heart and will pour a new, put a new spirit within you. When you get saved, you have a new spirit. And will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Christian growth, an evidence of change. A holy life pleasing to the Lord. A disciple is one who follows the Lord, but a disciple is one who's being changed. They're transformed as well. I will make you. And you can't define it. Answers in Genesis is a great ministry. We really like them. We support them. And we do their, Sunday, their Bible study, uh, their uh, VBS and they have an apologetic ministry, which is defending the faith. It comes from the Greek word to defend, not to apologize for, but to defend. And one of the things that we found, and I've had this discussion with some people, is we actually believe, I mean, and we, kind, we don't say this, but if we just get people the truth, we just defend creation, if we just defend everything else, they'll automatically say, well, I see the light, and we'll do that. No, it has to take the Spirit of God to change somebody. There's an internal change. Yes, all those facts are great. Yes, we can defend it. Yes, we can back it up analytically through apologetics or what we call systematic theology, if you want to call it that. But it takes the Spirit of God. Lastly, 
disciple serves Christ and makes other disciples. Serving. We find here he says, and I will make you fishers of men. In Luke 19, we have the discourse of Zacchaeus. The first, I think, 11 or 12 verses. And here's Zacchaeus. He got gloriously saved. The first thing Zacchaeus did is he invited Christ to his house to eat with him and all the other publicans or sinners. And what did the Pharisees do? They turned around and says, why are you eating with that group? Because Zacchaeus wanted to make other disciples. He wanted those that were his friends to hear what he heard. In fact, he goes on and says this. He says, for Jesus says in verse number 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Was lost. Previous to that verse, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, I give half my goods, I'll give half of my goods to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, which I just read, This is the day come to the house of for as much he is also the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The mission of Jesus was clearly seen during his encounter with Zacchaeus. He puts his faith in Christ. This is the day the kingdom has come to this house. There is evangelization, but there's also service, the hands. We're to join in the mission of Christ. By the way, everybody look here, and I'm almost done. Sometimes we hear that, oh no, we've got to go knock on doors, or we've got to hand out tracts, and there's nothing wrong. You can do that. Let me tell you, the mission of Christ is best served. Everybody look here. It's doing what you normally do, going through the life you normally go through, and living out Christianity in your life, having gospel conversations with the people that God has already put around you, and it's been providentially designed that they're there. That's what we're to do. I'd love to tell you the stories of people in our church that are that are getting a hold of this principle, that are actually having gospel conversations of different groups. They're starting to talk to other people. So they never thought about that. I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. I thought we'd just go to church, go to church, go to church. Now I realize God's put around people around me. When we know the Christ, when we know Christ, we look at people differently. We have a change in our heart. We lead to our, how we use our hands. Can I tell you, Christianity is not a consumer-based group. It's a service group. We need to go from being consumers to servants. Two weeks from today, we're going to kick off a... We're going to ask everybody, we're going to ask, because who's your one? Everybody has one. I want you to pray for your one, that you'll have a gospel conversation with them. You'll talk to them about the Lord. doesn't mean you're going to lead them to the Lord, but... We want us to have our eyes open as disciples and disciple makers. It's our job to be fishers of men, especially with the people just around us. I think of so much in our community. I think of a, there's a ministry in Fairview. It's this, it, they have a ponies and horses for handicapped kids. We have people in our church that are starting to reach out to that group. Oh, you're a Christian. You're doing, we see that. Oh, we can live like we want, live in our house, watch TV, come to church, watch TV, come to church. You can go through your life, but that's not the church of Jesus Christ. That surely isn't a disciple-making church. The fields are wide under the harvest. I meet with another pastor once a week. We pray. It's every Tuesday we try to. One of the things we, we both are in sync with is we're looking at things and we're saying, Wow. Our community really is wide open. It's almost 100% unevangelized. Less than most mission fields that we send missionaries to is Erie County, it just statistically. The fields are wide. Let's make disciples. Let's first of all get a hold of God, who he is, and get saved. Let's understand that it's our job to grow in grace and to be changed as Christ changes us. But then let's go out and serve. The Great Commission is in many ways the great omission. The Great Commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind, and the neighbor as thyself. 
Let's follow Jesus. So here's where I'm at for all of us. And I speak to my shame that I haven't followed through this either. Are you making a disciple? Do you know every Christian, I can build a very good biblical case, every Christian should be discipling somebody? That's where we need to go. That's what I need to do. By the way, you can't disciple anybody if you don't pray and reach out. And I think that's where we all are, all of us. Think about how that would change your family, your life, and your home. Think that would change mine as well. So a disciple follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is a fisher of men. And then I close with this. Are you saved? If you were to die right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? By the way, none of this is applicable to you until you understand who Christ is. Are you following Jesus? Are you changed by Jesus? Are you serving Jesus? What is your time with the Lord? What is your time into the Bible? Are you spending time with him? And are you serving Jesus? Ladies and gentlemen, are you a disciple? Let's all stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's stand together, please. Can we stand just for a moment? In a minute, the invitation is going to be given. We haven't done this in a while, but maybe since COVID, but we'll start today. Maybe you need to come to this altar and pray and say, God, help me. Help me be a disciple maker. I know specifically the person that you have put in my life. It could be a child. It could be a husband. It could be a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker. Help me have a gospel conversation. Help me as I study your word and read in your word. Help me to be the man or woman God's called me to be. Maybe you want to come to this altar and pray. Maybe you need to come to this altar and, because you're confused of what it means to be a Christian. Ask Christ to come into your life. We'd love to share you with the Bible what it means to be a Christian, and we'll have somebody show you that. But maybe you just want to come and pray. Maybe you want to pray in your seat. That's okay, too. Whatever it may be. As Iris begins to play, let's pray together. Can we do that?